I'm Kier. And I'm Alyssa from In Defense Of, a proud member of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the one you're listening to now. The opinions expressed are those of the individual hosts and guests. Be sure to check out all the other podcasts available at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. And get ready, because geekiness begins in three, two, one. You are listening to the Starling Tribune, a podcast dedicated to the Arrow TV show. This guy gets more airtime than the Kardashians, right? This podcast is not produced or maintained by the CW, Warner Brothers Television, CTV, or DC Comics. All characters, situations, and stories are the properties of Time Warner. I am the Oracle, and this is your Tribune. Welcome back to Earth 2's favorite newspaper called the Starling Tribune. I am the chief editor tonight. My name is SP, and I have some award-winning reporters for this episode number 195 of the Starling Tribune, including Chris. You have failed this city, and I'm going to take it back. Whoa, dude, that's really deep and all. You can have your city, man. Just don't hurt me. And the award-winning reporter and anchor of the local news, Michelle. Blow them all to hell. Wow. You guys are a little bit confronting this week. Let's just chill out a second, take it down a notch, and have some fun with this podcast, okay? I guess. Sure. Okay. This podcast is recorded on Tuesday, May 1st, 2018, live on Geeks.Live. That's right. And this evening, we'll be discussing Arrow, as well as news, interviews, articles, and announcements that have dropped in the last week that could impact future episodes of Arrow, as well as The Flash, Supergirl, Legends of Tomorrow, Vixen, Constantine, and God knows what else that makes up this DC universe. If you're new to the show, thank you for searching us out on the internet and joining us. After the show, you can check out our content at GunnaGeek.com, where you can also find other geeky videos, podcasts, and articles. Thanks, guys. Michelle, why don't you go ahead and lead into the breakdown the current episode for us? Sure. This episode is Shifting Allegiances. It's Season 6, Episode 20. It aired Thursday, April 26, 2018. Directed by Alexandra LaRoche. Credits include one Supergirl, one Arrow, three Flash, one Legends, and two Eureka. Written by Wendy Miracle, the current showrunner, and has written 24 er Arrow episodes. And Rebecca Bellotto, um, writer's assistant for 13 episodes of Arrow and has written five episodes of Arrow. This episode of Arrow aired last week, starting the 23rd of April, 2018. And now we're down to just three CW TV shows per week. Supergirl, because both Legends of Tomorrow and Black Lightning are concluded for the year. Supergirl aired the 15th episode of their third season, and they'll be the last to end in June with a live rating of 1.38 with the episode titled In Search of Lost Time. And... On Tuesday, the 24th of April, Flash aired the 19th episode of the fourth season called Fury Rogue to a live rating of 1.90. That's a rare below 2.0 rating for The Flash. And on Thursday, Arrow aired this episode titled Shifting Allegiances, as Michelle just described it, to a live rating, which we have to caveat, but to a live rating of 0.0. Point eight seven. Now, Michelle, you have a couple of notes of why that might be. Well, there is a thing called the NFL draft, and a lot of people like to watch that live. And it actually brought ratings down across the board on April 26th. Okay, not only was it the NFL draft, but it was on Fox for the first time ever, and it was the first and it was the first round of the draft. So everybody wants to know who the first pick of their NFL team is. Everybody else, every other round they can read about later. But yeah, if you're a casual fan or an ardent fan of the NFL and you have your team, you want to know which team is choosing who. And matter of fact, a lot of college football fans like the draft too, because it shows where their college is and where their favorite players go. So unfortunately, as you described, the live rating did go down and uh, yeah, I don't know if it's going to rebound at this point in time. I think we might be looking at just above one from now on. But we'll see. We only have a few episodes left. So with that lead in of the creative team and the ratings for the week, we're going to start talking about the episode 
in particular, the overall theme, which we always equate to the theme or the actual title of the episode. So, Michelle, what do you got there? Well, Oliver has been stressing about how he needs to go alone. So one of his immediate actions is to go to Anatoly and to get his help because he's wanting Anatoly to break from Diaz and be his ally and help him take down Diaz. And then, of course, there is Black Siren who's working with Diaz. Maybe she will switch and help Quentin. But this is starting the whole can can Oliver put cracks in the bad guy team? I mean, he does a pretty good start at well, what he thinks is a pretty good start, at least, because Anatoly's biggest beef is he got thrown out of the Bratva, his brotherhood, because he stood by Oliver. He helped Oliver. So what's Oliver do? He takes a quick trip to Russia, which you would think would probably be kind of hard to do when you know you're under investigation for being a vigilante and they're probably watching all of your movements. But he goes to Russia and takes out some folks to get Anatoly back into the Bratva. Okay. Let's talk about that. He is under investigation, and he is the disgraced mayor, ex-mayor of Star City, and he slips the country. He's on, By the way, he is on bail, and as you recall, it's a half a million dollars bail from the beginning of the season, and he just skips the country, goes to Russia, and decides to do some wet work for the Bratva. Not the smartest thing to do? No, not at all. Well, we've never claimed Oliver was smart. That's fair enough. Well, we had some fights. And a couple of the fights featured Diggle with the newbies. This is one of the things about this episode. I don't know how we feel about this. The, the hoss is back. If this was season five, I'd have been excited because Renee was one of my favorite characters then. This season, I find him tedious and annoying. Yeah, let's. that's an important note. Let's back up a second. In season five, the episode that described how um, he lost his wife and his daughter lost her, her mom, that was one of the best episodes. Controversial, but best episodes for Wild Dog of the entire series. And then now we're a year later and we're like, okay, we're tired of the Haas. Yeah. Well, Haas and co are trying to take down Diaz as well. And Renee seems to get a kick out of the fact that Oliver is alone and he seems to be proven right. And Diggle is with Argus and he fills in Argus about the quadrant. So Argus is after Diaz as well. And then we get a scene with Diggle and the Haas crew. And Diggle apologizes. Wait a minute. Are we calling the Haas crew or the crybabies? What are we calling them now? I don't know. For some reason, I just like the Haas crew. I, I prefer not to say the Haas as much as possible, actually. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so the newbies, you know, Curtis's team. Curtis's team. There we go. So we have Diggle and Curtis's team. And Diggle apologizes. Yeah, that's... SP, what did you think about Diggle apologizing? At this point in the series, I get what the writers were trying to do. I get what Wendy Miracle was trying to do. It was set up absolutely horrible. And the showrunners admitted it. We talked about it a few weeks ago where they underestimated the hatred that everybody really had to the crybabies or Curtis's team, as you're calling it now. And yeah, I, I just don't think that I would want to apologize to him because let's not forget that Renee decided to side against Oliver and testify against Oliver without discussing it with anybody on the team because he wanted his daughter back. I think the team could have found a way for him to get his daughter back and for him to not testify against her. And that's the it's sticking in my craw of why this other team and then they had to be under surveillance because of it and everything. I don't blame Diggle. I don't blame Oliver for that. I don't blame Felicity. Yes, they decided to put the other team under surveillance, but I put the original blame on Renee 
for sneaking behind everybody's back. So, okay, why apologize for that? Really, why do it? It's like, dude, you were wrong, and then move on if he wants to move on from that. And then the whole thing about Diggle leaving Oliver, we're still well acted, that episode was, but poorly written in storyline. I mean, the dialogue was supposed to be amazing in that, and it, it just was. So I don't think Diggle should have apologized. There was no reason for him to apologize. It's like, well, I'm here. You want to work together or not? And then just move on from there. That's exactly what it should have been. The apology, completely unnecessary and should not have happened at all. Diggle doesn't have anything to apologize for. This felt very middle schoolish to me, where friends have a falling out, and then there's another falling out between a group of friends, and they go to their old friends and be like, hey, I'm sorry. That's what it felt like here. It didn't feel natural. It didn't feel organic. Diggle shouldn't have to apologize for anything. And it still annoys me so much. Everyone's like, Oliver tried to kill Renee. Renee pulled an axe on him. An axe. What was he supposed to do? Let himself get hit with the axe? He defended himself after he told him to stand down. This this whole thing of, we didn't think it'd be so divisive. You wrote it to be divisive. The way you presented it, you made a clear, here's people we should like, here's people we shouldn't. There was no middle ground where you could be like, I can see both sides here. It was, no, you made New Team Arrow really annoying about what they thought, and you put doubt in everything. And they need to fix this. They need to move on from it, whatever it takes. When this season's over, I hope we're done with this, this schism between sides that feels so immature at times. So, Chris, let me ask you this, since you brought up the axe. You think the season would have ended better if Renee would have aimed for the head? <laughs> Quite possibly. Should have aimed for the head. Yes. Well, Curtis's team doesn't really do too well at the warehouse when the Quadrant and the Scorpions, you know, fight each other because they need to be rescued by Diggle. And that's how we get the team up. And Diggle is like, you know what, Argus, we, we're going to go after after these guys. And he's like, hey, you know what? Why don't you guys, you know, join us since you uh, accepted my apology? And then we get the the fight at the loading dock. And what gets me with this, all of a sudden, Curtis is like doing parkour. And I'm like, how the heck does he do this? And then when I rewatched the episode, I remember he said the line about being an Olympic athlete. And I forgot he was an Olympic athlete. Oh, you did. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Also, let's not forget the... <laughs> It was fun watching the drone come in because obviously it was done via just a normal drone. It wasn't done by a military drone, you know, at me flying drones. I know what it was done with probably an Inspire one or two, which is a DJI bird. Anyway, so the bird is coming in and it's launching its air to ground missiles on the trucks while Curtis is on top of one of the trucks. That's just so that he can have this cool moment with an explosion backdrop. But how's that song go they had on the MTV okay. Movie Awards? The explosions were happening while he was still there. He did not move off the truck. Hey, man, cool the guys don't exploded. look at explosions. It's okay. Oh, jeez. <laughs> hey, and then Curtis got that really cool moment when that one truck was getting away, and he got to throw one of his T-spheres, and that made another big boom. That well, was that, yes, cool. because... Yeah, what he was doing there, in case you didn't catch it, is he sacrificed one of the T-spheres because he uh, he stuck one of the reflectors on it for the drone to fire one of its last missiles at it. And then he threw the T-sphere at the truck. And about the time the T-sphere got to the truck, the drone had locked in on the painted circle and it destroyed the truck. Although, let me ask you guys, maybe, and I watched it twice, but maybe I missed it. They had eight trucks. They took care of five trucks in the initial barrage, and then one got away, and then he had to get it with the T-sphere. What happened to the other two? Did I miss that? Down for repairs? No, no. I, I think I think they skipped a little bit. Oh. I think they uh, destroyed two of the trucks, and they didn't catch it on screen, unless I missed it. I might have. I might have missed it, too. I might too. have missed it, too, as I'm thinking about it. Or maybe it's something that got cut out on the editing room floor or something like that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, I think they, they go, okay, five down, three to go, and then there's one left. So I think they missed something. I don't know. Chris, what did you think of Diggle teaming up with Curtis and Dinah? Well, I mean, to an extent, it makes some sense because he's trying to further Argus's goals of shutting down the Quadrant and figuring out what's going on in Star City. And 
Part of Diggle's reasoning for going to go and work with Argus is I'm going to do what I need to do to save the city. So partnering with these guys, even temporarily, is potentially a way to do that. However, I think he might have just been more successful with just the Argus strike team, in all honesty. Okay, you just said shut down the quadrant, and for the first time ever, I've equate the quadrant to either the Alpha Quadrant or the Delta Quadrant. <laughs> what about the Gamma Quadrant? And there's that, too. Go through That's the all... wormhole, SP. That's right. So we're all talking about Star Trek, the next generation age <laughs> of uh, space names, I guess. Hey, I want to say something about the fights here, because aside from the little idiosyncrasies that I have named so far and will continue to name, the fights were actually pretty good. The fights were at the quality that I would watch during season one of Arrow, possibly even a little bit of season two. So the fights themselves were pretty good. I just think some of the cuts and some of the storyline within the fights might have been done a little bit better, but kudos to either the real actors that were out there doing stuff, which did happen in this episode, or their stunt doubles. You did a great job. Yeah, it was good. The reason why Oliver goes to Moscow and somehow gets there and comes back is because he wants to get back with Anatoly. And Oliver interrupts Anatoly's baseball time. And he's trying to convince Anatoly that, you know what, Diaz is going to, you know, kill you or get rid of you once he's done. You need to come back to this side. I got you back in the broth. Uh, you can go home. Then Anatoly betrays Oliver, ends up taking him to Diaz. And then we get Oliver and Diaz in the same room. So, Chris, what did you think about like when all of a sudden Oliver and Diaz are finally together? Well, it's, it's nice to get more of a face to face than what we had earlier in the season, which is, well, I'm going to escape and you can't do anything to stop me, where you get to have a confrontation between the two characters that you know is going to result in something. There has to be a resolution of some kind. We're all hoping it's going to gear up to a fight, and it kind of does, because Anatoly kind of brings up the fact that beating a man in chains has no honor, and Oliver's standing his ground as he gets beat. I enjoyed the conversation that led up to the fight, and then I enjoyed the brutality of the one-on-one -on -one fight and the fact that Diaz really just cheats because he doesn't care. He just wants to win, however. But the one-on-one -on -one fight between those two, incredibly brutal, and you can see it on both uh, Kirk Acevedo and uh, Stephen Amell's faces afterwards, the way they did the makeup. Brutal fight. Yeah, Diaz was like, hey, if I get you on the ground, you leave Star City. If you get me on the ground, I'll leave. SP, were you, were you surprised that Diaz pulled out the knife? No, you knew he was going to win under any circumstances at all, though I thought it was a long, long game. And I really had to stretch my mind to get into the believability of it that Stephen Amell, or not Stephen Amell, but Oliver Queen, actually planned it this way he planned for the Bradfa basically to take him anatoly to take him to diaz and he planned for diaz to have a fight and then for diaz not to fight fair in order to get anatoly on his side for the long term that that's a long way to go especially for a guy that doesn't trust anybody anymore so i, I it's a big stretch for me really long stretch for me and okay, I think it paid off because yeah, Diaz didn't fight fair and he stabbed Oliver. He didn't kill him because he wanted Oliver to go through the trial, which obviously will be next week. And it's just what Diaz is. We haven't gotten to it yet, but Laurel is having a really hard time with Diaz because he's not just mean, he's not angry. He's not human is what she says. Well, this is coming from a gal that used to work for some pretty nasty people that I don't think were human either. Is Diaz really of that caliber? I don't know. And that got me thinking about the season in its entirety as well, where we, again, didn't get that tremendous buildup in the first half of the season where you had Caden James, which was really hard to see Michael Emerson as the ultimate villain in all this, especially after his appearance on Person of Interest. So... 
I think they could have done a better build up to his terribleness to Diaz's terribleness in the first part of the season, which would make this build up even more believable. But I don't know, maybe I'm just looking at this TV show too intensely because we podcast about it every week, because if I just sit down and try to enjoy this particular episode, I probably would have, but we're critiquing it. So I, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just critiquing it too hard. No, because what was interesting during that conversation between Oliver and Anatoly and, and Atoli's place, Oliver says that Diaz came to power because I was distracted. I was the mayor. I had a team. I had this. And Anatoly looks at him saying, if you think that's how Diaz came to power, you're a fool. And it just makes me wonder, how did Diaz do this? This is episode 20. I don't really understand why Black Siren is so afraid of him. If you've see, we watched a flash as well. And I guess if you are just an arrow viewer, perhaps you can understand Black Siren's position. But we've also seen Flash and she, you know, brought down buildings on Flash. She worked with Zoom. I just don't see Diaz as this death stroke. Prometheus level threat. Here, and another thing that kind of bugged me about Anatoly and, and what he said to Oliver later on was the fact that Anatoly said, Oliver, this is your fault for not letting me operate within your city. You're doing criminal activity in Star City and you were hurting people. And no, that is not what you do over here. That might be what you do over in Russia, but if you want to operate in America, you definitely don't do that. And uh, that is not being the honorable guy that he should have been. He was a different person at the beginning of this season than he is supposed to be right now. And I don't blame Oliver for what happened. I blame Anatoly for what happened at the beginning of the season. Yeah, I think you're fair. I think that's fair. Anatoly's anger at what happened clouded his judgment and did not let him be honorable anymore i mean and that's one of the things that oliver beats in not beats into it but kind of keeps bringing up is diaz is not honorable you're an honorable man anatoly diaz decides to test our new mayor mayor quentin lance and he gets laurel to do this and laurel calls him her father and Diaz doesn't seem to like that at all. Well, I mean, it's it's not her father, but I think part of it is Diaz is a control freak, and the fact that she's starting to connect with someone in this world outside of him, or is doing something besides being in fear of him or falling under his thumb, that's probably part of what he's not liking there. And I get the feeling that Diaz doesn't like to share his toys either. Yeah, um, I like that Quentin ended up coming around and understanding Laurel because he remembers working with Dark, which that was a nice pull. If you didn't remember, Dark threatened Laurel and Quentin did all of these things in order to save his daughter. And he ends up signing the paper to save Laurel. As a bargain with Laurel, he wanted Laurel to, his bargain with Laurel was, I'll do this if you help me get away from Diaz. And oh, by the way, I, question, Earth 2, did that have the same Damien Dark as Earth 1? I Did we ever see the Earth 2 Damien Dark? I don't, I don't remember. So. I don't think we okay. did. Because the Earth 2 Damien Dark might not have been as bad as the Earth 1 Damien Dark. I'm just saying. He's possible. Okay. So, yeah, so he signs the paper knowing that Diaz can get it anyway. I mean, Quentin's actually doing some thought here, and he's just using the paper as a bargaining chip for Laurel. And I think if you ever watch Laurel's face whenever she's around Diaz, it's like she's almost going to cry. I mean, she puts on she's a great actor. She puts on this smile every once in a while. But for the most time. Her eyes are like watering and it looks like fear on her face. And I could see her want to get away from Diaz from that perspective. But you're right. She's a superhero. She's probably the, the most powerful super on this show. 
and she's afraid of him. I just, I don't get it. You talked about it before to, in this quote, episode. Neil, because plot. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Yeah. Well, we we mentioned before that Renee is back, but he's not completely back. He actually freezes in the field. And he has an interesting conversation with Diggle where Diggle is like, I compartmentalize when I'm out in a field, I turn off the daddy mode and I'm just a soldier and I go and I can do this. Wasn't the case when he vaulted out of the back of that lorry with Sarah on the back of that motorcycle a couple seasons ago. That's a good point. Yep. And so Renee sits out the loading dock fight because he doesn't want to be a, a danger to the team, which is very responsible. And then at the end of the episode, Curtis goes to Renee and is basically saying to him, hey, we got to get Diaz. We need you on the team. Can you just get over it? Yeah, that's not cool. I don't really actually have PTSD and I don't really know anyone with PTSD. But I'm thinking that's not the right thing to do. Yeah, the answer is like, well, just get back on the horse. You'll be fine. In some cases, that's the right answer. I'm not in any position to say that is the right answer in this particular time or not. But either you get back on the horse and you keep doing it. And if you want to continue to be a vigilante, that's probably the right thing to do. But if you're suffering, you need to back away from it. And I think where we're going here, for, first of all, again, I see where the writers were trying to go at this point in time in the season. We're just not really getting it because we've seen we're not fans of the crybabies. We're not fans of the Curtis team for a variety of different means. And we were supposed to be sympathetic to them. We're not. And I think it was supposed to be a bonding moment finally between Diggle and and Renee and it it just it didn't turn out that way and it didn't turn out that way with Curtis later either and you know Renee's daughter is saying you need to to go out and be part of the solution to Star City and at this point in time you can't depend on the cops and again I have to go back like the feds aren't investigating this at all I mean you would think the quadrant would be a key target for the feds to be investigating and if they were moving into new territory you would think the feds would look into it and i'm not just talking about the fbi but atf argus a bunch of other agencies should be circling in on these people with the amount of damage that they're actually doing with the amount of ordinance and drugs that they are moving as well just saying but renee has to be part of the solution here and the daughter says okay I don't know how this is going to go. I think this is going to end up in Renee reneging against his testimony against Oliver. I think that's what's going to happen in the coming episodes, but maybe I'm completely wrong there. We're going to end up with a Oliver that's lost and back on Leon Yu at the end of the season. I don't know. Boy, Leon Yu would be a hellish place to be right now, though. There ain't nothing there. I would argue that because we've seen we've seen the... Um, where Laurel was picked up from. We know there's at least a building there. So, okay. I guess there might be a little bit there, but I mean, the fact of the matter is it's been blown up mostly. So there's not much plant or animal life to scrounge for. If you get dumped there either. There's always fish. The sharks. Sure. We know there's sharks. That's right. Cause he did get bit by that shark. I forgot yeah. all about that. Good call. And you know, there's a submarine in the middle of the, uh, the Island too. Oh, good point. I withdraw my statement then. Okay. Statement withdrawn. SP, you have been critical of the kids and how they've been written. What did you think of Zoe all of a sudden knowing that daddy's a vigilante and like William, she's okay with it? I mean, she might be okay with it, but I don't really think that she or William really know what this really means. All they know is that their parent is some sort of uh, activist. Um, I, I'm just trying to put it in their terms. I don't think they really understand what a superhero really is. And Williams made some terrible decisions on going out and try to solve things himself. And that's the whole thing with Caden James at the uh, 
end of the first arc here in the season. Zoe, she hasn't been put in the middle of it this season at all, other than she's been in foster care. She's been out of foster care. So I think she's just trying to keep the family structure going, and she knows that this is where daddy's got to go. So that's what I'm thinking. Also, daddy with the whole scorpion things, the Renee and the, and the scorpion and, and the laser mic. Did you guys notice at the horse betting track that the laser mic was interrupted several times when Curtis was actually listening and yes. saying stuff? It, it's got magic software that can put together what the words are that it missed. I don't so you're know. saying Damien Dark, actually, that's why the CIA doesn't have a laser mic like that, because Damien Dark put his magic in there, or Constantine? Yes, we'll go with that. Which one? Either. Okay. <laughs> I can't be picky. It's just some magic user. Who knows? Oh, <gasps> Zatanna. Ooh, if it gives us Zatanna in this series, I'm totally cool with it. Okay, the laser mic was magically enchanted by Zatanna. Okay, I'm, I'm good. I'm totally with on board with this. It, we're we're good. Ed Cannon accepted. Chris, is there anything else about the episode you would like to talk about? No, I can't really think of anything. I mean, I feel bad. Well, actually, yes, I do feel bad for Quentin in all of this because he starts to believe that this Laurel might care about him, which is totally misguided. Then comes the realization that she's playing him. Then comes back to the realization again that maybe she's trapped. I just feel bad for him because he has a ghost of his daughter that's in front of his face every day and can't get past the fact that she's probably evil. He just sees his daughter in her. I feel terrible for him. SP, anything you want to talk about? Yeah, I do. I do have one last thing, and it's really a poll for you guys. So you, you two answer, and for our listeners too, you have to answer this poll. So while watching American baseball, would you prefer some good Russian vodka or American beer? Chris? Am I watching on TV or am I at the ballpark? At, well, I, in the context of this episode, watching at home in front oh. of your big screen, 4K TV. Vodka then, because beer you got to have at the ballpark. That's a ballpark thing. Michelle, which one? I, I know you probably wouldn't partake in either, but just in the fictitious world that you could, which one would you choose? Beer, because I'm not really a vodka person. Yeah, I'd go beer too, but we just had to throw the poll out. So listeners, please go ahead and respond to us on... On our Twitter feed at Starling Tribune, would you prefer to watch American baseball with vodka or beer in the Arrowverse? And I'm just going to end with, I really wish I knew how Diaz overtook the city. I wish I knew why Laurel was so afraid. The actress is doing a good job conveying that she's afraid. But I just wish I knew what was going on. More information. Perhaps we'll get more information in next week's episode. It's called docket number 11-19-41-73. It will be season six, episode 21. It's going to air Thursday, May 3rd, 2018. The pressure mounts for Oliver, who begins to wonder if he will lose everything in his battle to save Star City. A familiar face returns. It's directed by Andy Armaganian, written by, well, teleplay by Uba Mohammed and Tyrone Carter, and the story by Mark Guggenheim. And if you watch the preview for next week, we probably know who that familiar face is, everyone. But mm -hmm. if you didn't At watch the, the, preview, end of the preview, yeah, if we didn't, if you didn't watch the preview, we won't ruin it for you. But a big thank you to everyone who participated in our chat room over on Geeks.Live today, and also to those of you that download the podcast at a later date from StarlingTribune.com or replay the video version of it over at YouTube.com slash GunnaGeek. Hey guys, guess what? We have an announcement to make. If you have an Amazon device, you can enable our Starling Tribune podcast as a skill. Yes, that's right. All you have to do is tell your Amazon device. You just say the wake up word, which is normally a word. So you say a word, enable the Starling Tribune skill, and you can have full player control. This is not the tune in version. 
This is actually a singular skill built by our media host, Lipson, specifically for our podcast. So go ahead and do that. Enable the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. skill and then let us know what you think about it. Go ahead and rate it in the Amazon skill store. And remember, you can always catch us live as we record at www.geeks.live, usually at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific on Sundays. We had to push it a couple of days this week just because of our personal schedules. But usually we're on Sunday, 6 p.m. Eastern and 3 p.m. Pacific. We would love to hear from you. We are the Starlight Tribune on Facebook and Instagram, at Starlight Tribune on Twitter, and you can call us at 612-888-CAVE. That's 612-888-2283. Well, this brings us to the end of another great episode. Any last words before we sign off? At Stargate Pioneer. Hashtag drone strike on Curtis. At the Chris Farrell. Hashtag American Baseball. And I am at Michelle Ely signing off with hashtag Argus so blue. Oracle, I think we're done here. This was the Starling Tribune. You can leave us feedback at gunageek.com or check out our archive at starlingtribune.com. Visit gunageek.com for more podcasts. Music by Kevin McLeod can be found at incompetech.com. This podcast is not produced or maintained by the CW, Warner Brothers Television, CTV, or DC Comics. All characters, stories, and situations are the property of Time Warner. No infringement is intended. We will see you for the next episode of CW's Arrow. <laughs>